in the previous video where we described phosphorus adsorption, desorption, we showed you a graph or a set of reactions that look identical to what you see on the bottom of this, this slide. And we mentioned that as you move from left to right, phosphorus in the form of orthophosphate becomes labile. This is adsorption onto the edge of a aluminum hydroxide mineral. And if the reaction continues to the right, phosphate forms not just one bond like it has here under the labile phase, but it forms two bonds with the edges of these aluminum hydroxide phases or minerals. And two bonds are very strong. And this is, this is known as mineral precipitation. So we're gonna talk about mineral precipitation for a few minutes with this video. Mineral precipitation is simply the formation of phosphorus containing minerals. In the case at the bottom, this is an aluminum, uh, aluminum phosphate. The same reactions that you see here on this slide would occur with iron oxides or hydroxides. All you would do is replace aluminum with iron in this picture, okay? These minerals that precipitate are called secondary phosphorus minerals, and these minerals form in soils. The natural weathering scheme is to have primary minerals which are almost all, actually they're always apatites. They're, they're calcium phosphate mineral phases that weather naturally over time, release calcium and phosphorus into the environment. You have secondary calcium phosphate mineral phases that form that look almost identical to the primary mineral phase. And then as soils continue to weather and weather and become or go from basic pH, which is where we find apatites, calcium phosphate minerals to acidic. The calcium phosphates dissociate. And where does the phosphorus go? It finds another place to be loved. And that phosphorus or orthophosphate loves to be loved by iron, aluminum, and sometimes manganese at low pH values. Those are also secondary or maybe even tertiary mineral precipitates in soils. So I think I just mentioned this, but initially, when minerals, no, I didn't mention this, but when precipitation initially occurs, the mineral that is formed is relatively highly soluble, right? It, it may be available to plants, maybe, but it's highly soluble regardless. And over time, these minerals that you see within that box in the bottom become via reactions less and less soluble over time. The mineral structure may look the same, but when these minerals first precipitate, they're amorphous in nature. They're like a blob. And if you know anything about mineralogy, maybe you've taken a class on miner mineralogy where you've tried to identify different minerals using X-ray diffractometer. These first minerals that precipitate have no crystalline structure or very little crystalline structure. The crystalline, stru the crystalline structure arises over time by this becoming more and more crystalline and more and more structured over time. Over time, you could take a mineral that looks like this and put it in the XRD, and the XRD will tell you basically that you have, in this case, an aluminum phosphate. Okay, it'll tell you the mineral phase. So I did mention this already on this slide that these precipitation reactions, and they can go backwards to become dissolution reactions. These are pH dependent reactions. They are dependent on the pH of the soil. So let me share with you how this works, what I just described on this slide. So this is a diagram that shows you pH on the x-axis from acidic to basic. And on the y-axis, this is the log of H2PO4 minus or HPO42 minus availability. Now, okay, this is the log scale. That's basically what this is telling you. And I like to think of the y-axis as phosphorus availability. The greater you are on the y-axis, the greater 
phosphorus is available. And lower on the y-axis, the less phosphorus is available. So this is what happens. And let's pick on, let's just pick on like a pH of about seven, right? Let's talk about, let's keep this simple. Let's talk about phosphorus fertilizer applications to soils. When we apply phosphorus fertilizers to a soil, we apply a form of phosphorus that's highly soluble. Oftentimes these are phosphorus salts and salts dissolve readily in water. I mean, think of table salt. You put some table salt in water, poof, it's in the solution phase. This occurs with all of our fertilizer, almost all of our fertilizers that we use on the market today. Why? Hmm. We want an almost immediate supply of whatever nutrient we're applying, and salts will do that. And phosphorus salts are no exception. So when we add a phosphorus fertilizer to a soil that has a pH of seven, the fertilizer itself likely is not even on this graph. So what this graph shows you are a bunch of lines that correspond to quite a few different phosphorus mineral phases that precipitate over time. So this is what happens. You add a phosphorus fertilizer. Let's say the solubility is way up here on the y-axis and our soil pH is seven. Phosphorus loves to be loved. It's going to be feeding plants, but it's also going to form reactions with other minerals in the soil to reduce phosphorus availability over time. So you add a phosphorus fertilizer way up here, and eventually some, if not most of that phosphorus ends up in this mineral phase here. And you don't need to know the name of this, DCPD, doesn't matter what it is. This mineral is relatively soluble, according to the y-axis. It has a relatively high P solubility. So what does it do? It doesn't like to be present in soils. So it'll react in soils and form DCP. And DCP is still relatively soluble. And so it'll reform, it'll dissolve and re-precipitate, and it'll form OCP. And it'll dissolve and re-precipitate and form beta TCP, and it'll dissolve and re-precipitate re and form hydroxyapatite, which can dissolve and re-precipitate as fluorapatite. The minerals at the very bottom of this figure are highly insoluble, all right, according to the y-axis. So this is a good point or a good time for me to tell you that when we mine soils or geologic formations for phosphorus, where do we often find these formations on the globe? We find these formations in areas or in formations themselves that are highly basic, that are high pH, right? So you can just imagine on the face of the planet where soils have a high pH. I hope you can imagine this. These are typically in arid to semi-arid environments, not always, but yeah, they're oftentimes in arid to semi-arid environments where the, the geologic pH over time has been basic. And so we mine our soils for both hydroxyapatite and fluorapatite to create phosphorus fertilizers. This is the scheme on this diagram to go from lines up higher on the graph itself to eventually lines that are down lower. Under high pH values, that's what occurs. Under low pH values, the bottom lines over here, let me, the bottom lines over here on the left-hand side are known as varicite and strengite, right? And these two lines at low pH values are on the bottom of the figure under low pH values. And these are aluminum, phosphates, which is varicite, and iron phosphates, which is strengite, okay? The phosphorus mineral phases on the right-hand side under basic conditions, these are all calcium phosphates, FYI. So let me share with you this last figure. This figure shows you the combined effect of both precipitation reactions 
and adsorption reactions. And we learned about adsorption reactions in the previous video. So both of the processes, adsorption and precipitation, are dependent on pH. And so what you see here is these figures or these curves as a function of pH, pH on the x-axis, an extent of phosphorus retention on the y-axis. And you know where we grow our plants, typically between five and a half and maybe eight and a half. So you can ignore some of these curves. At five and a half, insoluble iron and aluminum phosphates dominate. And so does adsorption to iron and aluminum oxides and, if present, to the edges of clays, one-to-one -one type clays. These dominate right around pH 5.5, and, and they start to taper off as you increase pH. Let's go to the other end next. At high pH values, like around pH 8, give or take, insoluble calcium phosphates, mineral phases occur, as well as adsorption to the surfaces of calcium carbonate where phosphate replaces carbonate and forms calcium phosphate mineral precipitates on the surface. And this tapers off as you decrease pH. Where both of these curves intersect is where the extent of phosphorus retention in almost any given soil is rather low, meaning the available phosphorus for plants is rather high. And that target is right around pH 6.5, give or take. Okay. So think about this puzzle that you're learning this semester. And think about when we discussed liming acid soils. And think about the target pH values that we typically target for most mineral soils, which tends to be between pH 6.2 and 6.8, give or take in the Midwest. And then putting the puzzle together, think about what you see in front of you here. Soil fertility is a big puzzle. And you're going to find this out as we continue to teach you throughout the semester.